The heartbeat depends on a finely tuned electrical system where every impulse starts, travels and ends with precision. But when this rhythm is disrupted, the consequences can be life threatening. That's where antiarrhythmic drugs come in. Antiarrhythmic drugs are commonly classified using a modified version of the Vaughan Williams system, first developed in the early 1970s. This system divides antiarrhythmics into four main classes based on their primary mechanism of action. Class 1 drugs block sodium channels, class 2 are beta blockers, class 3 primarily block potassium channels, and class 4 are calcium channel blockers. In this lecture, we'll focus on the class 2 agents, the beta blockers. If you are looking for a broader overview of beta blockers and their effects on the heart, I've covered that in a separate video in the Heart Pharmacology playlist. Here, we will concentrate specifically on the antiarrhythmic actions of beta blockers, how they work, when we use them, and why they're important in managing cardiac arrhythmias. Before we dive in, it's important to have a solid understanding of the ionic basis of cardiac action potentials. If you're not already familiar with this topic, I recommend watching my dedicated video on cardiac action potentials, where I walk through the ion channels and ion fluxes that shape the electrical activity in different parts of the heart. Understanding that foundation will make the rest of this presentation much easier to follow. You'll find the link to that video in the description below. Feel free to pause here and come back when you're ready or continue if you're already comfortable with those concepts. Beta blockers, also known as beta receptor antagonists, act as competitive inhibitors at beta adrenergic receptors. These receptors, often called beta adrenoceptors, respond to agonists like adrenaline and noradrenaline also known as epinephrine and norepinephrine. When an agonist molecule binds to the receptor, it activates it briefly before unbinding. This binding and unbinding can happen repeatedly, with each interaction triggering receptor activation. But when a beta blocker is present, it competes for the same binding site. Once it binds, it does not activate the receptor. Instead, it blocks the site, preventing agonist molecules from binding and triggering a response. This is how beta blockers competitively inhibit adrenaline and noradrenaline at beta receptors, which results in reduced stimulation of the heart by the sympathetic nervous system. There are three subtypes of beta adrenergic receptor, but the beta-1 subtype is the main one in the heart. These receptors are found throughout the myocardium, but the ones important for rhythm are located in the pacemaker regions. The sinoatrial node at the top of the right atrium generates electrical activity and sets the heartbeat. The atrioventricular node at the lower part of the right atrium delays the signal before passing it to the ventricles. If the sinoatrial node fails, the atrioventricular node can take over as a pacemaker, though at a slower rate. These regions are supplied by postganglionic sympathetic neurons. They release noradrenaline, which acts on beta-1 receptors to speed up the sinoatrial node and increase conduction through the atrioventricular node. The adrenal glands above the kidneys are supplied by preganglionic sympathetic fibres. These release acetylcholine onto chromaffin cells in the adrenal medulla, causing them to secrete adrenaline into the blood. Circulating adrenaline reaches the heart, activates beta-1 receptors and amplifies the effects of nerve-released noradrenaline. 
beta adrenergic receptors are G protein coupled receptors. I will keep the explanation brief here as I provide a more detailed lecture on them in a separate video with a link available at the end of this lecture. These receptors couple to the stimulatory G protein GS. When noradrenaline or adrenaline bind to the receptor, the GS protein is activated and in turn stimulates the enzyme adenyl cyclase. This enzyme catalyzes the conversion of ATP into cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP acts as a second messenger, triggering cellular changes that produce the physiological effects of noradrenaline and adrenaline. One of the actions of cyclic AMP is to stimulate HCN cation channels, also called funny channels because of their unusual properties. HCN stands for hyperpolarization activated, cyclic nucleotide gated. Each channel is formed from four subunits and each subunit has a cyclic nucleotide binding domain on the cytoplasmic side of the membrane. When cyclic AMP binds to this domain, it causes a conformational change in the channel. HCN channels are opened by hyperpolarization, but cyclic AMP acts to facilitate this process. On its own, cyclic AMP cannot directly open the channel, which still requires hyperpolarization. However, cyclic AMP makes the channels open more readily when the membrane hyperpolarizes. Cyclic AMP also stimulates the activity of calcium channels. In nodal cells, there are two types of calcium channel, T-type and L-type. The cyclic AMP pathway specifically targets the L-type channel, primarily CAV 1.2. It works by activating the enzyme protein kinase A which phosphorylates sites on the cytoplasmic side of the channel complex. The channel is composed of four subunits, the pore forming alpha-1 subunit and the auxiliary beta, gamma and alpha-2 delta subunits. Protein kinase A phosphorylates both the alpha-1 and beta subunits. Phosphorylation of the alpha-1 subunit directly alters channel gating while phosphorylation of the beta subunit fine-tunes regulation and helps transmit the adrenergic signal. Importantly, phosphorylation does not directly open the channel. Instead, it sensitizes the channel so that it opens more readily when the membrane depolarizes. The reason that stimulating HCN and L-type calcium channels increases heart rate and conduction becomes clear once you understand their roles in shaping nodal action potentials. In nodal cells, the membrane potential is constantly changing. As one action potential ends, the resulting hyperpolarization opens HCN channels. These are non-selective cation channels, but at negative potentials, their main effect is sodium entry which drives the slow depolarization known as the pacemaker potential. As depolarization progresses, HCN channels gradually close, but the rising voltage activates T-type calcium channels. Their calcium influx continues the pacemaker depolarization until the cell reaches threshold, the point at which L-type calcium channels open. At this stage, L-type channels carry a large calcium current that produces the upstroke of the action potential. Unlike in most excitable cells, the upstroke in nodal tissue is mediated by calcium, not sodium. Depolarization then activates potassium channels, which repolarize the cell back toward the starting level. This hyperpolarization reopens HCN channels beginning the cycle again. Now, 
Let's see what happens when HCN channel activity is stimulated by the sympathetic nervous system through beta receptor activation. After an action potential, as the nodal cell hyperpolarizes, HCN channels open more readily. This means the membrane begins to depolarize again sooner. The slope of the pacemaker potential also becomes steeper, so the cell reaches threshold more quickly. Even if the duration of the action potential itself doesn't change, repolarization occurs earlier and the interval between action potentials is shortened. As a result, action potentials fire more frequently, which increases the heart rate. Now let's consider what would happen to the action potential if beta adrenergic receptors only stimulated L-type calcium channel activity. These channels are not involved in the pacemaker potential, so that phase would remain unchanged. The effects appear once the cell reaches threshold and L-type calcium channels open. With greater channel availability, calcium influx becomes faster and larger. As a result, the upstroke of the action potential is both faster and larger. Because the speed of the upstroke determines how quickly an action potential is conducted through tissue, conduction velocity through the atrioventricular node would be increased. Beta adrenergic stimulation enhances both HCN and L-type calcium channel activity at the same time. Looking at a run of action potentials, stimulation of beta receptors increases the firing rate of nodal cells, which raises the heart rate. This effect comes from a steeper pacemaker potential and a more depolarized baseline. At the same time, the faster upstroke of the action potential increases conduction velocity through the atrioventricular node. All of these effects of beta adrenergic stimulation are reversed by beta blockers. The ability of beta blockers to limit sympathetic stimulation of the sinoatrial and atrioventricular nodes means that they exert important effects on the heart that underpin their use in the treatment of arrhythmias. First, by reducing the automaticity of the sinoatrial node and slowing heart rate, they suppress tachyarrhythmias. Second, Slowing conduction through the atrioventricular node limits the number of impulses that reach the ventricles. This property makes them particularly useful in conditions such as atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter and AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia. Third, they reduce ectopic activity, especially when it is driven by overactivity in the sympathetic nervous system. Finally, after myocardial infarction, Beta blockers reduce the risk of dangerous ventricular arrhythmias by lowering sympathetic tone and myocardial oxygen demand. Clinically, beta blockers are used in several important arrhythmia settings. They help control heart rate in atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. They are effective in both acute and chronic management of supraventricular tachycardias. They reduce the risk of ventricular arrhythmias in patients with ischemic heart disease or cardiomyopathy. And they are first-line therapy for catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, a rare inherited condition where arrhythmias are triggered by stress hormones, specifically the catecholamines, noradrenaline and adrenaline. These are the main beta-1 selective beta blockers used in the treatment of cardiac arrhythmias. Notice that beta blockers are all given names that end in LOL. Metoprolol is one of the most commonly prescribed. It's available in both oral and intravenous formulations, making it useful in both acute and long-term settings. However, its plasma half-life of only three to seven hours means it must be taken two to three times a day. A 
Atenolol has a longer plasma half-life, so once daily dosing can be convenient for patients who need simpler treatment schedules. Bisoprolol is highly beta-1 selective and often preferred in patients with coexisting heart failure because it tends to be well tolerated at low doses. Esmolol is different. It's given intravenously and has an extremely short half-life which makes it ideal for acute arrhythmia control when rapid titration and quick reversal are important. So the choice of beta-1 blocker depends on the clinical context, whether rapid control is needed, whether the patient requires long-term therapy and what other conditions they may have. The initial letters of these drugs spells the word BEAM. To help remember them, Think of a beam focused on the heart. Non-selective beta receptor blocking drugs act by blocking both beta-1 and beta-2 adrenoceptors. Since beta-2 receptors are widely distributed in the airways, blood vessels, uterus, gastrointestinal tract, bladder, eye and metabolic tissues, blocking them can sometimes be harmful. For this reason, these drugs are generally avoided when beta-2 blockade may be dangerous. For example, in asthma or COPD, they increase the risk of bronchospasm, and in Raynaud's phenomenon, they can worsen vasospasm. Although beta-1 selective blockers are usually preferred, some non-selective agents remain clinically important. Propranolol is a classic example. It is highly lipophilic, meaning it crosses the blood-brain barrier where it additionally suppresses central sympathetic drive. Sotolol stands out because it not only blocks beta receptors, but also has additional class 3 antiarrhythmic effects, making it especially valuable in managing some arrhythmias. Nadolol is long-acting and particularly effective in conditions like long QT syndrome, and catechol aminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, where sustained protection is important. Finally, some agents like carvedilol produce alpha-1 blockade in addition to beta blockade. This dual action produces vasodilation, helping to lower blood pressure and improve circulation. So, while beta-1 selective drugs are usually safer and preferred, Non-selective blockers still hold a unique and important place in therapy, each with its own strengths and clinical applications.